that. Hello, and thank you for coming. I am Dr. M. Anshin Tevis. I'm a osteopathic physician in Ithaca, New York. And this is a class, uh, this is the level one breath class, um, where we are going to discover the entire thoracic diaphragm and try to spread it all over the body. So we will start with anatomy, as always. Let me just pull up my little picture here. And we start with anatomy. So this is one of my favorite images. This is an image of your thoracic diaphragm. This is the image that you would, this is the view you would see of the only muscle that you need to use in order to get your best breath. It's this muscle right here. And this is a view, this is the view you would see if you were standing on the bladder, looking up at the chest cavity from below. So you can see that the diaphragm, thoracic diaphragm is a sheet of muscle. This pink stuff here, can, get, can you guys uh, see my little cursor moving around? So this pink stuff here is muscle. This white stuff here is connective tissue. It's called the central tendon. And you can see that this is a sheet of muscle and connective tissue attached to the bottom of the sternum. And you can, you can touch your own sternum here. It's right at the bottom of your chest plate, right in the middle there. Um, and then you can trace around the bottom of the rib cage. Um, that's what my cursor is doing here. My little arrow is tracing around the bottom of the rib cage. You can see that the diaphragm attaches here to the tip of the 12th rib. And then there's a little bridge from the tip of the 12th rib to the tip of the transverse process of L1. This is the first lumbar segment and it's got a little spike on the side that the diaphragm attaches to that little spike. And then there's another bridge from the tip of that spike to the front of the lumbar spine. And then there's yet another bridge you can see from one side of the lumbar spine to the other side of the lumbar spine. These little bridges allow for structures to be both in the chest cavity up here, as well as in the abdominal cavity. And those structures are these two muscles, the quadratus and the psoas. And it also allows this structure, this is your abdominal aorta. This is the big artery that brings blood to the lower body from the heart. Now, we said that the diaphragm attaches, you can see it comes all the way down the lumbar spine to L4. L4 is at the level of your navel. So if you want to know how far down your diaphragm, well, actually, I'll show you that in a minute. Um, and I want you to see that the that L4 the fibers that are the tendons that are attached to L4 actually come up and create this loop. So if you follow my little arrow here, you see that these fibers attached to the right side of the L4 vertebra come right up here and make this little loop. This is the hole, this is the loophole through which your esophagus moves through your diaphragm and becomes your stomach. So this here is your lower esophageal sphincter. This little loop of diaphragmatic muscle fibers is what keeps food from coming back up your food pipe. Your, yeah, your food pipe, your food tube when you eat. The part of the diaphragm that I want you to pay the most attention to right now um, is this back part here, the part of it that's attached to your spine and is attached to the tip of the transverse process, the tip of the 12th rib, and just these fibers generally on the back of the diaphragm. So just try to take a little mental picture of those and we will uh, come back to this in a moment. So let me now take this from being a, a, a two-dimensional picture and show you where these things are on a body. And it'd be great if you like followed along with me on this. So, if you put your fingers at the bottom of your sternum or this breastplate right in here, if you feel there's a little bony tip and you follow the bottom of your rib cage around, you can actually trace it on both sides, right? 
And once you get toward the back of your body, you can just cut straight to the spine. So that's how far the diaphragmatic dome comes down. But if you wanna know how far it climbs down your spine, take one finger and put it on your navel. And then if you draw a line from your navel to the top of your hip, and then keep going to your spine, that's the level of L4. That's the level of L4. So you see that the level of L4 is basically level with the top of your hip, right? So your diaphragm comes all the way down to the top of your hip on the back of your body. It comes down to here on the back. It comes down to here on the front. It's a really good idea to um, do that with your fingertips. Uh, you know, when you're first learning how to do this, I would do that a couple times a day, at least, just to try to build your, your, your awareness of that muscle and where it's attached. So what I'd like you to do now is take some deep breaths. Whoever is watching this video, take some good deep breaths. Take a handful of them. And as you take them, I want you to pay attention to the sensations that breathing produces in your body. Breathing produces changing sensations in the body. Inhalation feels different from exhalation. Where do you feel those changing sensations on the body? Now, most people are going to feel most, if not all of the sensation of breathing right about here at the bottom of the rib cage on the front of the body. Some of you may feel some or even most of the sensation of breathing up here on the front of your body still. So whether it's here or here, most of us feel all of the sensation of breathing on the front of the body. And most of you don't feel much if any sensation on the back of your body. However, um, what I'm gonna do now is I'm gonna show you another picture. Um, oops, wait, there we go. Most of your diaphragm is actually on the back of your body. So this is another view of the diaphragm. This is the same muscle as the one in the other picture except this is what it looks like from the front. And what you can see is that the diaphragm is somewhat like a sta open stage curtain where there's two little slips of muscle on the front, but this whole backdrop is muscle. In fact, most of the muscle of your body, of your diaphragm is actually on the back of your body. So, um, but most of us are not feeling much, if any, sensation on the back. And the reason for that is because almost all of us are not using, let me, let me say that differently. The vast, vast majority of us are not using these fibers on the back of the body. Now there's a reason that we have most of the fibers of the diaphragm on the back of the body. That's because that's where we need the most pumping action. So now I'm going to do my little interpretive dance to show you how the diaphragm works. So the definition of a diaphragm is a sheet attached to a frame. Any sheet attached to a frame is a diaphragm. Like we said already, your thoracic diaphragm is a sheet of muscle and connective tissue attached to the bottom of your sternum, the bottom of your ribs, the transverse process of L1, and the front of the lumbar spine all the way down to L4. Because our diaphragms are sheets of muscle and connective tissue, they're, and they're mostly muscle, they can do what muscles can do. And what muscles can do is contract and relax. They can shorten and they can elongate. That's how muscles work. So when your diaphragm is relaxed, it's shaped like a dome or a cathedral ceiling, a parachute. And when the muscle fibers contract, the diaphragm flattens out. 
like more like a drum head. And when it flattens, the contents of the abdomen get smushed down. And as a result, they squish outward, like an exercise ball will squish if you sit on it. Simultaneously flattening your diaphragm enlarges the volume of the chest cavity. That's like opening a bellows. When you open a bellows and make it larger inside, you create a vacuum. That vacuum is what sucks air into the bellows. So when your diaphragm contracts and flattens, creating a vacuum, it draws air into your chest cavity from the external environment. When your diaphragm, and we call that inhalation. When your diaphragm relaxes, the muscle fibers elongate and the diaphragm domes back up. It goes from being flat like a drum head to being domed up like a parachute again. And that, uh, that allows the organs that were smushed to rise up underneath the dome of the diaphragm and occupy space behind the rib cage. Simultaneously, that made the chest cavity smaller in volume. That drives the pressure up, and as a result, air goes out, and we call that exhalation. So your diaphragm is a pump that moves air into and out of the chest cavity from your internal environment. I mean, sorry, from your external environment, from the world around you. Simultaneously, your diaphragm is a pump that moves fluid into and out of your chest cavity from your internal environment. So blood that's in your veins, lymphatic fluid, extracellular fluid, and even sinus drainage. All those fluids, all the fluids in the body are going to come towards your chest cavity every time you inhale. Every time you exhale, the, uh, the, the added pressure in your chest that results from the diaphragm doming back up, that added pressure in the smaller chest squeezes your heart and helps blood move out through the arteries, contributing significantly to cardiac output. So while there's more to it than this, the bottom line is that your diaphragm has a circulatory function. In fact, your diaphragm is the primary driver of circulation in the body, far outstripping the heart's contribution. And this is shocking news to most of us because that's not how we normally think about it. Even in the medical profession, that's not how we normally think about it. We think the heart is what does the work of moving fluid in the body, even though we know that the heart contributes only to cardiac output. It all, the, the, the muscular contraction of the heart only participates in moving fluid out of the heart. It doesn't participate at all in bringing fluid back. Your thoracic diaphragm coordinates all the fluid return and contributes significantly to cardiac output, perhaps even dominantly. So this is, while this is shocking news to many of us, this is also very, um, very good news because better fluid motion is better physiology. And your diaphragm, unlike your heart, sorry, my puppy is circling for a more comfortable spot. So I'm gonna repeat that because I don't know if you could hear me. So, this is really great news for all of us because unlike your heart or any other organ in your body, your diaphragm is made of skeletal muscle. That means it's quite amenable to your conscious control. 
That means that we can improve our fluid motion by choice. No different really from contracting your, your, uh, your bicep or your quadriceps. You know, these muscles that we're used to being able to just grab and squeeze. Your diaphragm is the same kind of muscle. And the more we use it consciously, the more control we can have of it. And this is really great news because better fluid motion is better physiology. Better fluid motion is better mechanical function. Better fluid motion is better autonomic balance. It's better recovery time. It's better, it's better coordination, structural integrity. So what we need to do, what we're going to do for the rest of this class is we are going to try to help you get more conscious control of your thoracic diaphragm so that you can start to use it to improve all of those things. So, like we said, uh, and, and in order for me to, to uh, at, at this point, I, 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 wanna, I wanna give you my sort of sales pitch on why I think this is so important for you to do this on a daily basis. Um, at least nine breaths when you first wake up, but the truth is the more you practice breathing, the better you will feel. So, um, so, so I'm gonna give you my little sales pitch, giving you an, a little bit of uh, understanding, a little physiologic anatomical understanding of why um, this, is, uh, this is like getting the keys to the city. So um, let's talk about lymph or extracellular fluid. This is the fluid in the spaces between your cells. This is the fluid that you would see if you were to skin your knee. Now, this clear fluid, we could say, from one perspective, you could say this arises from the blood. Because as the blood is passing through from the arteries, through the capillaries to the veins, the capillaries being the bridges between the arterial system and the venous system, these arteries, I mean, these capillaries are tiny. They are microscopic vessels with very thin walls. These walls are so thin, they are semi-permeable. They are thick enough to uh, retain the very large red blood cells that pass through them. They can't get out of these thin-walled vessels. However, the vessel walls are so thin that carbon dioxide and, gas and oxygen gases can trade places. They can pass through the capillary wall. At the same time, the plasma, plasma being the clear fluid that your red blood cells are floating around in, this plasma is made of very small molecules too. And so the plasma can leak through the capillary wall. And when it does, we start calling it lymph. And this lymph is what brings stuff to your cells, like nutrients, fats, proteins, it's the means by which your immune system gets where it needs to go in the body that's outside of your blood vessels. And most of your body is outside of your blood vessels. It's also the place where your cells dump their metabolic waste product. So the longer the lymph sits in any given spot in the body, and, and understand this, most of the fluid that leaves your heart as blood actually does not return to your heart as blood. It returns to your heart as extracellular fluid, as fluid, as fluid that has leaked through the capillary walls and must make its way back to the heart through the spaces between the cells, through fascial planes, through lymphatic vessels, and then finally dump back into the veins. So like we said, the longer this fluid sits in any given spot in the body, the more it becomes concentrated in waste product and depleted in nutrients. The more it becomes concentrated in waste product, the harder it becomes for cells to get rid of waste product. The same principles apply to uh, if you're somewhere where the trash can is too full. 
and the paper towels are overflowing it. And in order to get your trash in there, you have to kind of smush stuff down a little bit. It takes more energy when there's already a lot of trash around. So your cells are going to either have to use more energy, which is your energy to get rid of that waste product, or that waste product might begin to accumulate inside the cell. And when it does, it will start to interfere with the forward motion of your biochemistry. All of the reactions in your body, you've probably heard the, uh, ex the expression, oh, I have a, a fast metabolism or, oh, I have a slow metabolism. Well, what, what makes reactions go slow in the body versus quickly? Um, it really has to do with the kinds of conditions that you have inside the cell. So um, some things like high temperature may make your biochemistry move forward faster. A cold temperature may slow those reactions down. A high concentration of products already present in the cytoplasm is going to slow down the reactions that are producing more of the waste product that your body's trying to get rid of. So your metabolism will actually slow down if there's already a lot of waste product present. Nobody needs that. And it's not just slowing down your metabolism, it's slowing down cell repair. It's slowing down all the processes of life that you want to move forward. So it's very important to clear waste product from the tissues. Everything that is congested with lymph will be stiff, like a plant stem is stiff when it's full of fluid. It will probably be painful or at least tender, and it will always lack the kind of vitality that it could have if it were not congested. very important to clear waste product from the tissues. And the main thing that does that for you is your thoracic diaphragm. So we want to maximize the stroke volume of this diaphragm. And the way we, will, we do that is by fully contracting it and fully relaxing it. It's just as important to fully relax it. If you have a bellows and you only close it halfway, you're only going to be able to get a half stroke back in. The only way to, the way to get a bigger, uh, bigger stroke in is by closing it all the way. So we have to relax the whole diaphragm and then we have to try to recruit the whole diaphragm. So let's take just a moment. Um, I, I want to point out some, I want to uh, see, I'm going to, um, I'm going to show you some slides. Um, here's another one of the thoracic diaphragm. See bottom of the sternum, bottom of the rib cage, front of the lumbar spine. But the, the, the picture that I really want to show you right this moment, I want to show you a couple slides because in a couple of minutes, we're going to uh, attempt to do the breathing practice. Um, but in order to do that, I want to uh, give you some uh, visual tools to work with. And here's one of them. Like we said, I'll do that one more time. Like we said, the diaf a diaphragm is a sheet attached to a frame. So when you're looking at the surface of a body of water, you're actually looking at a diaphragm. I don't know if you've ever, I'm sure you've seen sometimes if you fill a glass all the way to the top, you'll have a little bit of a, a dome of water that goes over the top and it's held in place by surface tension. Surface tension on a body of water forms a sheet of increased stickiness between those water molecules. So they form a sheet and that sheet is attached to the edge 
of the body of water, whether that's a glass or a pond or the ocean. Um, but this surface tension creates a diaphragm. And I'm going to show you two, a couple of other little videos. So here's one of them. And you see here, there's multiple children making multiple waves in this diaphragm. A parachute is a diaphragm. Let's show you that again. When all these kids are making these waves, you can see that these waves crash into each other. And none of them make it all the way to the other side of the diaphragm, no matter how hard any of these individual kids try to, you know, lift and pull and lift and tug on their little bit of fabric. Now, why is that? Oh, now I want you to see what it looks like if just one person makes a wave. You can see that when one person makes a wave, that one wave maker can recruit every fiber of that diaphragm. They can cause that wave to move all the way through that diaphragm with just one flick. I'll show you that one more time. Just one flick of the wrist recruits every fiber and touches everybody else's hands. So um, now what I'd like you to do is we need to, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to talk you through a breath practice and we're going to uh, try to find, our first, our first project is to find the back of your diaphragm. Um, and so the best way I think to start doing this for most people is to start in a supine position with your legs bent over a bolster or a pile of pillows. So I can go ahead and, and give you a couple moments to go ahead and, and lie down. It's, it's also, I, I, I think it's probably also okay to do it in a recliner. The main thing here at first, I, I prefer a supine position though, lying flat on your back with your knees bent over a bolster. The main thing is that you don't wanna have any hyperextension in your lumbar spine when you're trying to practice breathing. So, um, if you can find a com comfortable supine posture um, and, uh, and put enough pillows underneath your knee, knees to make it so that your low back can lay comfortably flat on the floor. And, um, and if you want to just give me a little, uh, a little, I think there's a button you can press that says, and just tell me that you are, you got your position. Give me a little thumbs up and let me know you're ready to go. And I'll start talking you through breath practice. I can't do that. <laughs> oh, okay. What, what's, where, what's your situation um, at, at home? Well, I, I have a chair that I'm sitting in, but I can't, the only time I go to lie down is when I'm going to bed. So I'd have okay. to do these exercises in the bed. Yes. I can't sit on the floor or anything like that. The bed is a fine place. If, if you're able to lay, uh, to lay on your bed and put some pillows under your knees, um, that would also be fine. But maybe you're not in a good situation to do that, in which case I can try to adapt, adapt this um, to a seated posture. Tell me, tell me what your needs are. Well, I can try it in the bed if I just, you know, listen to what you're saying. And then when I get in the bed to do that, it would oh, be good. Okay. To yeah. We can do it that way. I mean, there are a lot of, of these uh, of recordings online already. Why don't I try to go ahead and give you one from your seated position right now? And, and I'll try to tell you how it differs from the... Um, from the supine, uh, but we can try to do it from the seated position as well. And then um, you can watch uh, the breathing practice from another one of the level one breath classes. And if, if you listen to that while you're lying in bed, it will talk you through that part. Does that make sense? Yes. That, yes. That, way, that way for this whole class, you're getting to participate and then you can go back and do it in the supine position um, when you're able to get in bed. Does that work for you? Yes. Super. All right. Then, um, then I'll tell you the key to do it to taking this from supine to seated 
is to find the appropriate posture. So what I want you to do right now is I want you to notice where you feel most of the sensation of breathe. Uh, uh, I want you to notice whatever, whatever seated position you're in, I want you to notice where you are on your sit bones. So bring your awareness to the bones that you're sitting on, your butt bones, if you will, sits bones. Bring your awareness to those two bones in your butt. And we're gonna start by letting you go ahead and slouch, right? Let me turn myself sideways so you can see what I mean. So I'm gonna slouch, right? With my back rounded over like this. Um, and when I'm slouching, I'm sitting, I can tell that I am on the back slope of my sit bones when I'm like this. Now, for many of us, when we're told to sit up straight, what we do is this. We hyperextend the low back to tilt the upper back backwards. Do you see that big curve in my low yes. back? Yes. So anytime you hyperextend a diaphragm, you, um, you compromise its function. If you think about what happens uh, if a parachute turns inside out, it can't, uh, it, it's not gonna function anymore, right? Or even an umbrella, right? It needs, it needs all of the attachments to be engaged. When it's hyperextended, I can't access the back of my diaphragm. So what we wanna do is this, Bring the awareness to the sit bones. Go ahead and let yourself slouch, right? Go ahead and slouch. Feel, can you feel that you're on the back of your sit bones when you're slouching? Yes. Great. So now go ahead and roll forward on your sit bones until you're doing what people think of as sitting up really straight, like a tension. And notice that when you're here, you're on the front of your sit bones. Are you there? I'm not sure. <laughs> so, so you feel that you're on the back when you're slouching, right? Yes. Now, if I roll forward on my pelvis and lock myself forward with that big curve in my low back, now I can feel that I'm on the front of my sit bones. Can you feel how you can roll from the back to the front? Yes. So what I want you to do now is start in the slouch position and slowly roll forward till you feel that you are on the place where you are not on either the front or the back. When you find the transition point between the front and the back of the sit bones. Have you found that point yet? I don't know. It seems like when I, when I move, the weight feels like it's on the thighs. When you roll forward? Yes, it may be the chair that I'm sitting in. It, 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 it may be. What might help you to do is maybe slide a little more toward the front of the chair. Yes, that's what I just did, yeah. Okay, so can you, can you feel that you can find the transition point between the front and the back now? I think so, yes. Great. Now, and, and, and the chair you're sitting in, does it have a back? Yes, but now that I've moved up, I'm quite a distance from the back. Okay. Do you have something like a pillow handy that you could put right behind your back? No, I don't have something that I can get hold of. Okay. Um, <laughs> do, do you want to, would you like to take a moment to, to get a pillow and I can- No, because I don't want to be getting up to do that. <laughs> Uh, that's okay. That's okay. So what we'll try to do is this. So stay on the transition point between the front and the back of the sit bones. And what I want you to do, um, trying to figure out how, how I can do this without any sensory feedback. Is there, is there anybody else home with you right now? No. Okay. So can you, can you, um, Do you, do you have a sweatshirt or a, a sweater or anything like that? A little towel? I have a sweatshirt here. 
Okay, so what I want you to do, I'll show you what I'm gonna have you do. All right. So what you do is you're gonna take the sweatshirt. Now take the sweatshirt and you're gonna put it what I usually do when I'm teaching people how to breathe live. I usually let them feel my back when I'm breathing. I probably have more movement on the back of my body than I do on the front of my body. And it's pretty dramatically different. Can you see my, Tara, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, Tara, are you there? Hold on, it takes a moment to unmute. Yes, I am. Okay, can you can you can you see the the shirt wrapped around my back? Yep, uh, just from the mid back. We don't see all the way down to L four. You don't have to see all the way to okay. L four. Okay. Yeah, we see, see it. That? Yes, perfect. So, so what you're gonna do is you're gonna put the sweatshirt around your back. You can feel for where the bottom of your rib cage is, right? Because remember we traced around the bottom and then we went right through here. So this is where you want the sweatshirt to be. You're gonna hold it up against your back like this. Can you see what I'm doing there? Yes, I can. So what I'm gonna do now is I'm going to bring my mind, what I wanna do is waken up those muscle fibers on the back of my diaphragm. So what I'm going to do is I'm gonna focus my, use this shirt to focus my awareness there. And what I'm going to do on my next inhalation is I'm going to try to push the sweatshirt off of my back with my breath. So I'll empty all the way down and then I'll start to inhale. You may even be able to see my back moving in this video. Yeah, we can see it moving. I mean, I can. Oh, good. Can you see it too? I think so, yes. <laughs> Good, I'm gonna do another one, okay? I'm gonna, I'm gonna finish emptying and then I'll take another breath in. So what I want you to do is use, the, use that little strap across your back to focus your awareness so that you can contract the muscle fibers of your diaphragm. We're, what, we're, what we're not doing, what I'm, I'm not doing when I breathe, I'm not doing this, right? Let's see if I can do it from here too. I am. I'm expanding all the way around my torso. So give it a try. See if on your next inhalation, you can feel the back of your body pushing into that strap, trying to recruit those fibers. Yes, I can feel it pushing back. Wonderful. Now, does that give you a bigger breath when you do that? Yes. Mm. Isn't that awesome? You can just make a decision and get a much bigger breath better fluid motion, especially better fluid return, is always going to be better physiology. And it's that accessible to you. So now what I'd like to do is I'd like to help you make your exhalation get easier. And in order to do that, what we're gonna do is we're going to use a visualization. We're gonna use a visualization and I want you to imagine that you have uh, if you've ever seen a church organ, you know how they have those pipes that go up? Yeah. I want you to imagine that you have a row of organ pipes that come down through the top of your head and your shoulders on the back of your body. 
And what I want you to do on your next inhalation, uh, I want you to generate that big pressure by pushing the strap off your back. And then when you exhale, I want you to imagine you could bypass these two little holes on your face and let the pressure go right up out the top of your head. Just relax, 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 and see if you can allow that pressure to move right up out the top of your head. Go ahead and take a nice big breath in and release it through those organ pipes. What I think you'll find when you do this is that the breath seems to trickle out of the nostrils. Most people, when they first learn how to take that big breath with the back of their thoracic diaphragm, they do one of two things when they exhale. They either, they, they generate the big pressure. They have to open their mouth to let the pressure out because they think that if it just comes out of their nose, they're gonna spray everybody. The other thing that people do is that once they generate that big pressure, they kind of tense up their chest cavity so that they let the pressure out slow. Don't blast people. But you really don't have to do that. If you imagine that you could release this pressure through the top of your head, were you, were you able to feel how, how the extent to which you could release the pressure through relaxation? Yes. yes. Excellent. Another way to do this is if you imagine that the back wall of your body is a screen door and that every time you have this big pressure inside your body, you could just let it blow right out the back wall of your body. Why does this work? Why can we take such a huge breath and only have a little tiny trickle come out of our nostrils when we exhale? It's because most of the pressure you feel in your chest is not air, it's fluid. So it will never come out of your nose because it's not in your airways. It's in the spaces between your cells. It's inside your veins. It's in the lymphatic vessels and it's in, in between the fascial planes. It's, being, it's, it's very similar to what happens when the rain falls on a mountainside, right? The, the rain falls on a mountainside and the water seeps down through the rocks and the dirt and it gradually filters its way down the mountain and may eventually join a river and moves on to the ocean. It's very similar. The plasma leaks out of your uh, capillaries and works its way through cells. It works its way between muscles and organs in the fascia. And then it gets, finally gets into these lymphatic vessels that carry it back to the venous system. So um, you can, every time you generate a big breath, um, just relax and it will simply dissipate. In fact, any tension you hold in your body trying to control the outflow, anything you do to try to control the outflow actually restricts the motion of fluid. The way you will get the best motion of fluid is to relax everything you can find to relax and the fluid will move, it will dissipate. And you can take the biggest breath you want and never feel like you have to control the outflow. So now that we've done that, let's go ahead and further refine your inhalation. So we've got a bigger initial uh, inhalation already, but let's see if we can refine that further. And in order to do that, I'm going to have you recall, in fact, I'm gonna bring it back since you're sitting up and looking at the screen, gives us a little advantage. I want you to recall this gentleman making a wave through this diaphragm. And so what we're going to do, we're going to take advantage of the natural capacity of a diaphragm to ripple. Diaphragms have many very interesting capacities. They have the capacity to change the pressure gradient. And what does that mean? That's what the sail is doing when it catches the wind and draws the boat along. That's what the parachute does when it slows you down as you're jumping out of a plane or something like that. The diaphragm is capturing pressure and using that to generate power. So 
Another capacity of a diaphragm is the capacity to ripple. And we saw that on the surface of the water. We see that in this parachute. We wanna take advantage of that in our breathing. And so what we're going to do is we're going to start the breath in one place and we're going to let it ripple forward. We're gonna start it on the back of your body. So on your next breath with your strap in place, I want you to start the breath by pushing into the strap. And then I want you to see if you can let it, just let the wave travel through your tissues. See if you can let the wave move forward from the back of the body to the front and from, uh, from the bottom to the top. See if you can start the breath there and notice that when you do, do this, the wave moving through your body does the work of filling your chest for you, making your breath not only uh, bigger, because you're getting more complete and coordinated recruitment of your thoracic diaphragm, but also because it's, it's, it's also making your breath easier. Can you feel how you can let the wave fill your chest for you? No, I'm not sure about that. <laughs> oh, that's okay. That's okay. Let me try to explain it again. Um, do you get the idea of making a wave in, in a parachute? Yes. So, um, and you, and you, and, and, and so what I want you to do is, and perhaps it may be that you're already, it may be that you're already doing this when, uh, when you're breathing. I mean, when, when, uh, since you started using the strap to get a bigger breath, but see if you can let the very first action of your breathing be to push on that strap and then let that first action be what causes the motion in your belly and your chest and your shoulders. So give that a try and see if you can feel that there's actually a wave that can move through your body and help you more completely recruit your thoracic diaphragm. Were you able to feel the wave? I think, I think so. Wonderful. Well, you know, I will say, I will uh, use the words of my fantastic mentor, Dr. Gentry. Um, one of the things that's really important to do when you're on this sort of path of discovery, self-discovery and otherwise, suspend disbelief. <laughs> if you think you feel it, you probably felt it. So just go with it. Because the more you allow that to happen, the more you're going to develop your nervous system, the relationship between your nervous system and your muscular system. And it's just going to become increasingly familiar to you. Now, we're going to get a little more technical. And this might be hard to do in the, in, in the seated position. Um, unless, no, I think that's too hard. Um, but what we're gonna try to do is we're gonna try to start the breath on the spinal cord itself. We're gonna try to, to focus on the part of the diaphragm that is attached from, L, from L1 to L4, right? That's the part of your diaphragm that is at the level of your sternum and the level of your navel. So, but on the back of your body, not on the front. So bring your mind to the back of the body in that same spot on your spine and see if you can start your breath by pushing your spine backwards with your breath and then allowing the wave to spread out from that center line. Try, let me know if you can feel it. Well, again, like I say, it seems so, but you, like you say, suspend that disbelief. <laughs> I, I'm going to encourage you to sp suspend disbelief. Does it feel like it's making your breath get easier and bigger? Well, that time it didn't feel bigger, but it was easy. Okay, good. Let's, let's go one more step then. 
Um, let's, let's try to start the breath. Let's try to start the breath right here at L4. We're gonna to try to start the breath here and we're gonna to try to, have you ever, um, have you ever had a like tied a rope? This was an experiment we used to do in science class. Um, tied a rope to like a doorknob or something. And then you can take the rope and you can flick it. And when you flick the rope, you'll make a wave in the, in the rope that travels from your hand to the doorknob. Have you ever seen that? Well, I don't know if I've seen it, but I can picture that, yes. Cool, great. So what we're gonna to try to do is we're gonna to try to start that wave right behind your navel. And then we wanna to try to let it roll up the spine. When it, gets, when it gets up here to L1, it's going to break off. It's kind of, this is gonna be, as this travels up, this is like a wave at the edge of the ocean being split by a boulder. You ever uh, been to the edge of the ocean and seen how waves will come up to big boulders and, and, yeah. and, it, and the wave will split off and it will roll around each side of the boulder? Yes. Yeah. The, the two little waves will crash into each other at the other side of the boulder. And when they do, they, they, they add to each other. So we're gonna try to start the breath here at L4. We're gonna let it roll up. And then I want you to see if you can feel, I want you to see if you can feel sense, uh, like a ripple of sensation coming around the body to the sternum. See if you can feel that little ripple. Can you feel the little ripple, ripples? No. no. <laughs> Can't feel that one, that's okay. That's okay. When you do this in supine position, what you'll do is um, you'll have a face cloth or some, some little strap we'll, we'll use to give you, it could even, you don't want it to be too thick. Um, although it probably doesn't matter if you're lying on your bed. Um, you know, like a, uh, like a, a rolled up face cloth something that's maybe about, uh, that gives you just a little bit of pressure in the part of your body you're trying to feel. So what you'll do when you do this supine is you'll put it across the back at first, and then you'll take another little piece and actually lay it on the spine itself. And that will help you, that little bit of sensory feedback will help you focus your, um, your intention um, and your effort into the place where, into, into these very specific parts of the diaphragm. So go ahead and, and take a couple more tries, trying to feel the wave, feel yourself starting the wave at the navel. It's almost as if the, when you start to breathe, um, you're gonna let the back wall of your body at the level of L4, which is level with the top of the hip, you're going to, you're going to let that back wall move backwards. That will actually, as that moves backwards, it will actually take your abdomen and they will both move away from each other. Once you do this initial action, the wave will travel up the spine and, and the whole body will expand concentrically. Take a couple more breaths and see if you can feel that before we move on. Start it at the navel. Start it at the level of the top of your hip. Let that part of your body move backwards as you begin your inhalation and it will push the front of your body forward at the same time. Do we get it? I do feel the, that separation that pushing against the back and the front coming forward, but I don't know about the wave. <laughs> That's okay. That's okay. I, a lot of times what happens, remember what we said, everything congested with lymph will be stiff, will probably be painful, and it will lack vitality. 
a lot of times when we're first starting to move these diaphragms, some of the sensations may not be as uh, vivid as others. And that's often because the tissues are stiff because they're congested. But the more we practice breathing, the more we remove congestion from the tissues, the more movement that we'll feel. So if, you, if, if you're feeling it come up, and you're feeling the back move forward and the, the, the back move backward and the front move forward right. at the same time, and then you're feeling it come up, that's fantastic. Especially doing this in a seated position. You are obviously very talented. You're Kung Fu pretty good. So, um, so now I want you to keep doing that. Start the breath at L4, let it roll up the spine, let it spread, let it be big and easy at the same time. Big and easy go together. When we over effort, we actually put tension in the tissues. It restricts the motion of fluid and maintains stiffness. So big and easy go together. So now I want you to keep doing that. But as you're doing that, I want you to bring your awareness now into your abdomen. Like here's my, the bottom of my sternum. Here's my navel. I want to, for now, bring my awareness in here kind of the middle and the top of my abdomen. And I want you to notice the changing sensations you experience in your abdomen as you inhale and exhale. I want you to notice that breathing produces changing sensations. When you inhale, you feel more pressure in your abdomen. Yes? Yes. When you Actually, exhale, the what's that? pressure seems to move up a little bit from the abdomen. Yes, yes, it does. When, when you inhale, you make more pressure as you're squishing the organs. When you exhale, you can feel decreased pressure in the abdomen, yes? Yes. And what you, as, you, as you continue to practice this, what you may notice is that these sensations that you experience inside your abdomen feel very similar to the sensations you experience if you're standing in the tide at the edge of the ocean. A wave comes in, it puts all kinds of pressure on your body, it pushes you to the shore. When the wave goes out, you feel a drawing sensation on your organs. Just like you feel a drawing sensation on your body when the wave recedes and it kind of drags you out to the ocean. Can you feel those changing sensations inside the abdomen? Yes. <laughs> That's my dog's voice. He's doing a little. <laughs> I wouldn't want you to miss out on the cuteness. Um, so um, the, way, the, the thing is that, that this is tidal motion. That's why it, it feels the same as the ocean waves because, well, it is the same kind of motion. And what I want you to do now, our next, our next project, you know, everywhere you generate sensation around the borders of your diaphragm when you inhale is a place where you have muscle fibers contracting. And, when, and so you can use that awareness, that new awareness of all the sensation on your back, you can use that awareness to help you guide your intention to relax when it's time to inhale. If you, if you squeeze your bicep and tighten it, then you're like, oh, that's where my bicep is. So when I go to relax it, oh, I can really relax it more deeply because I, 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 I made myself more aware of where it was. So when you inhale, you make yourself more aware of the fibers of the diaphragm. So when it's time to relax, you can really deeply relax it. So every time you exhale, I want you to see if you can relax your diaphragm more deeply than the time before. I want you to see if you can let just a few more fibers in that sensory area, let them go. And I think what you'll notice, you're gonna notice a couple things. One is every time you can relax more deeply, you're gonna let more air out of your chest. And you can even continue to relax when the air stops moving. I encourage you to do that. Relax until you don't have anything left to relax and then inhale. 
And then let that, that sensation of contraction spread all the way through the diaphragm. And then the next thing that I'd like you to notice is that every time you relax more deeply with each exhalation, the sense of drawing in your abdomen goes deeper and deeper through your abdomen. It goes down, it passes your navel, it dives into the pelvis and goes all the way to the pelvic floor. See if you can keep relaxing. Don't strain, don't compress, don't like tighten anything to do this. I don't want you to be going, oh, I need to breathe, I need to breathe. Just see, is there more I can relax? And if you can find more to relax, keep relaxing. And see if you can allow this sense of drawing to, to, to plunge all the way down past your navel, through the pelvis and sacrum, all the way to the floor of the pelvis. When it gets to the floor of the pelvis, if you let your pelvic floor be very deeply relaxed, what you're gonna feel is you're gonna feel the pressure lifting off of your pelvic floor. And what your pelvic floor will do eventually, at the end of your exhalation, it will lift up a little bit. It will lift up. And once it's lifted, it will drop. So see if you can do that. See if you can relax so deeply that you let that sense of drawing go all the way to the pelvic floor. And what happens, I don't know if you've ever done a Kegel exercise before, but if you've ever done a Kegel exercise, that's what it is. It's squeezing the muscles of the pelvic floor so the pelvic floor lifts. Well, you can get the pelvic floor to lift simply by letting yourself empty so much that the pelvic floor lifts up towards your head as well. When your pelvic, are you feeling any motion at the floor of the pelvis? It did seem like it, it hit the floor of the pelvis at that sort of. So you felt, you felt, you felt it touch the floor of the pelvis. It did seem that way, yes. You're doing great. You're doing great. That's fantastic. I would do better if I was sitting in a, a like my dining room chair or some straight back chair, you know. That's probably true, but I'll tell you what, we will give you the um, we will give you the link to this right away so that you can try it from your dining room chair too. Right. And you can also try it supine. So so now what we're gonna do is I, I wanna explain to you that when the pelvic floor lifts, when the pelvic floor lifts at the end of exhalation, it can be the last thing to contribute positive pressure to the chest cavity because it's going to lift up your internal organs and they are going to push into the thoracic diaphragm and that is going to make your chest cavity get a little bit smaller. When it drops, when it drops, which is what it does, when it's just what it does right after it lifts, it's gonna drop. It can be the first thing to generate vacuum pressure because it's going to draw your organs down with it. And that's going to draw your thoracic diaphragm down. And that's going to start to fill your chest with pressure. I'm afraid I'm going to have to leave now because I thought this was from six to seven. <laughs> you know, um, it, it was, and you don't have to be afraid, and this is a great start. Um, uh, yes, I really appreciate it. Oh, it's my pleasure, really. It's my pleasure, really. And, uh, and, and we'll be back here the first of next month, but there are lots and lots of, of free videos available on the YouTube. If, uh, if you can call my office and leave your, your email, um, we'll send you, a, a, I think, probably one of the, the most recent links to the, the breath class I did before this. I took a two-month break, um, but then we can, get, we can send you a, a link to one of the breath classes so that you can get the rest of the practice.